Welcome to the DVD Shelf Movie Reviews, where movies are celebrated, not incinerated. Again, we'll be showing you exclusive footage that was taken earlier today that's still being sent in to us by you, our viewers. Now, get a load of this. Horrified spectators were able to catch glimpses of, well, what appears to be a gigantic dinosaur or something wreaking havoc downtown. And frankly, no one can explain it. Scientists are baffled. The National Guard's in disarray. Republicans are blaming Democrats and Democrats are blaming Republicans. Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. As I speak, true chaos is gripping the streets of one of the nation's largest metropolitan areas. No one knows where this beast came from, but you can take my word for it that he's not likely backing down without a fight. It's like something out of one of those old Japanese monster movies. But this, my friends, is no movie. More on this story as it develops. Meanwhile, speaking of nightmarish creatures, Lindsay Lohan made the news again. That's enough of that noise. Oh, hey everyone, David Rose here, your host of the DVD Shelf Movie Reviews. And yes, I'm coming to you today from my trusty old Fallout shelter, which I've stocked with plenty of rations and uh, plenty of DVDs to keep me occupied as this danger passes. So, yeah, I guess you've seen the news. Looks like we have ourselves a prehistoric mutant dinosaur on the loose. Don't you hate it when that happens? But I, I just can't sit idly by and let this monster have his way with my city, but what can I do? How do you destroy something like that? Well, maybe the answer lies somewhere within this. The very first Godzilla movie from 1954. And maybe if I take a good long look at it, I can find the key to stopping the horrible rampage going on out there. Now, before we go any further, there's something I need to get off my chest. I've never really been the biggest Godzilla fan. Oh, oh, okay, 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 okay. Let me finish. Look, I just never really grew up with these movies, so there's really no nostalgia at play here. Sure, I've seen clips from several of them here and there over the years, but to me, they've always come off as kind of goofy. Now, in saying that, I would never look down on fans of this franchise. I fully respect and admire the legacy Godzilla has left on the world and popular culture, but still, it's just never really been my cup of tea. So given that, why would somebody like me go through the trouble of reviewing the original Godzilla? Besides the whole trying to figure out how to defeat him thing. Well, because, honestly, when I watched it in full for the first time, I was actually blown away by it. Then I began to appreciate it even more after doing a little research. There's a genuinely compelling story behind the making of this first movie, and I thought it would be an interesting experiment to come at it with a fresh, unbiased perspective from someone like me who, on one hand, didn't grow up a fan of this franchise, but on the other hand, is an overall film lover who's always interested in uncovering the inspiration behind the creation of a globally recognized icon such as Godzilla. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Today, we'll be looking at the original Godzilla, Japan's first ever Daikaju Ega, or in English, Japan's first giant monster movie. We'll bear witness to the tragic true life events that spurred the creation of this now legendary creature and the surprisingly dark and somber film that first brought him to life with ambitious 1950s era special effects. Now I know there are hardcore Godzilla fans out there who could do the entire franchise a much greater justice than I ever could, so this episode will mainly focus on the original film along with its Americanized counterpart, Godzilla King of the Monsters, a re-edited version of the original that first exposed Godzilla to the United States and the rest of the world. I'll also delve into the well put together 2012 Blu-ray release from the Criterion Collection and see what special features they were able to pack in here to appeal to both hardcore Godzilla fans and folks like me who were just more curious to discover the cultural significance of this famous sci-fi spectacle. Then as always, I'll give the Blu-ray my final recommendation. And to wrap up the episode, I'll just give a brief rundown of the massive legacy Godzilla has left on the world. Now one last thing before we go any further. Some of you might be thinking, well, you're already pissing me off because you're not calling the original film Gojira. But to my knowledge, Godzilla is just as valid of a title as Gojira, the origin of the name I'll get into later. The Japanese to English translation logic is a bit messy to get into, which of course involves the three famous Japanese characters that make up the name. It's a long story, and I've already got a long enough story to tell. So, I'm well aware of the original Japanese pronunciation, but I'll be sticking with Godzilla for the rest of the video. So now, let's dive into the one, the only, the original, Godzilla. Directed by Ishiro Honda, 
and starring Akira Takarada, Momoko Kochi, Akihiko Hirata, and Takashi Shimura. It was released theatrically in Japan by Toho Company Limited on November 3, 1954. It was first released on DVD in the United States on September 5, 2006, and the Criterion Collection Blu-ray was released on January 24, 2012. A bright and sunny Hawaiian morning in December of 1941 soon gave way to tragedy and mass destruction as the Japanese military conducted a surprise attack on the United States naval base at Pearl Harbor, located on the southern coast of Oahu, one of the larger Hawaiian islands. Following the attack, the United States had over 2,400 casualties, 21 sunk and or damaged battleships, and an immediate declaration of war against Japan by President Franklin Roosevelt thrusting us into World War II. It's been said that, not long after the attack, Japanese Naval Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto made his now famous quote stating, I fear all we have done is to awaken a sleeping giant and fill him with a terrible resolve. Now the U.S., along with Great Britain and the Soviet Union, led several other countries in an allied force to ward off threats from the Axis powers, another handful of countries led by the nations of Japan, Nazi Germany, and Italy. As the war played out over the course of the next four years, the U.S. and the United Kingdom conducted numerous air raids on the nation of Japan, killing hundreds of thousands of citizens, destroying many major cities, and causing a drastic decline in their economy. But it was in 1945 that the United States carried out two of the deadliest attacks in human history. By now, the war was coming to a close as Nazi Germany declared their surrender on May 7th, and the U.S., along with the U.K. and China, sought a declaration of surrender from the nation of Japan. The ongoing air raid campaigns against Japan were leaving the nation in a heavily weak state, and they were finally given an ultimatum that if they did not surrender, they would suffer, quote, prompt and utter destruction. Japan saw this as a bluff and ignored this ultimatum, and on the morning of August 6, 1945, the U.S. deployed an atomic bomb codenamed Little Boy on the Japanese city of Hiroshima, instantly killing roughly 70,000 people. But over the course of the next several years, radiation poisoning and other long-term nuclear-related effects and injuries upped the estimated casualty count to around 200,000 people. With Japan still refusing to surrender, the U.S. dropped a second bomb, codenamed Fat Man, on the city of Nagasaki on the morning of August 9, 1945, immediately killing another estimated 60,000 people. The nation of Japan could take no more and officially surrendered on September 2, 1945, officially ending World War II. Now, even though these two historic bombings successfully ended this grueling war, historians have debated ever since over the moral and ethical reasoning behind the bombings. Had the U.S. gone too far by killing hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians, or was it all worth it to finally bring an end to this war? Obviously, it all depends on your own perspective, but these attacks weren't the last time the U.S. would be the target of controversy when dealing with weapons of mass destruction. Now the war may have been over, but global tensions surely weren't. After the surrender of the Axis powers, the United States and the Soviet Union arose as the world's two leading superpowers, but with both having heavily conflicting political and economic viewpoints. Over the course of the next four decades, the U.S. and the Soviet Union were engaged in the Cold War, a period of time where the two enemy nations never directly fought each other in combat, but tensions and hostility continued to linger. What also developed between the U.S. and the Soviets during this time, among other things, was an ongoing nuclear arms race where the two nations competed for possessing the superior military technology, including who had the more powerful nuclear weapons, and scary enough as it is, all this was happening during a time where there was really no actual fighting going on. These are the Marshall Islands, composed of over 30 coral atolls that lie approximately 2,800 miles southeast from the shores of Japan. Now up until World War II, the Marshall Islands were owned by Japan, but during a 1944 anti-Japanese air raid, the United States conquered the territory, eventually turning it into the main testing ground for nuclear weapons and continued using the islands for that purpose up until 1958. Now, the public was told to keep away from the islands and their surrounding areas, but the reasons for this were kept confidential until an unfortunate incident in early 1954 sparked worldwide controversy. On January 22, 1954, 
a small tuna fishing boat carrying 23 crew members sailed out of a harbor located in central Japan and headed out to sea, seeking out the bountiful fishing areas of the Northwest Pacific Ocean. The crew members named the small vessel the Lucky Dragon No. 5, a name that would sadly go on to define irony. In the midst of the U.S. versus Soviet arms race, both nations began testing thermonuclear hydrogen bombs, which were vastly more powerful and deadly than the atomic bombs that flattened Hiroshima and Nagasaki. On March 1, 1954, the U.S. detonated its most powerful weapon to date on Bikini Atoll, located within the Marshall Islands testing grounds. By this time, the Lucky Dragon fishing vessel had looped back around towards the Marshall Islands, and on the morning of March 1st at around 6.45 a.m., the ship's crew witnessed a horrific sight as the horizon suddenly lit up in flame. Eight minutes later, they heard a deafening explosion coming from the direction of Bikini Atoll. Not long after, the crew found themselves and the ship covered in a mysterious grayish-white coating of dust so thick that they were able to scoop piles of it up with their bare hands and toss it overboard. Despite being unaware of what they had just seen, the crew members were still extremely alarmed, so they pulled up their fishing nets and quickly headed back to the Japanese coast, arriving there two weeks later. What the crew didn't know was that they had just witnessed the detonation of the deadliest nuclear weapon the U.S. had ever set off, a 15-megaton hydrogen bomb codenamed Castle Bravo that was a thousand times more powerful than the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, the Lucky Dragon had remained outside of the designated danger zone surrounding the Marshall Islands, but due to various factors, the bomb ended up being nearly three times more powerful than experts predicted, greatly expanding the dangerous radioactive boundaries. And this mysterious gray dust that coated the crew, the ship, and the bountiful catch of fish was actually the ash and small bits of debris that were heavily contaminated with dangerous levels of radiation when the bomb went off. On March 14th, the vessel made it back to Japan, but crew members were already feeling the effects of radiation poisoning. As the crew members grew more and more ill, they were hospitalized in Tokyo, and their various symptoms, most prominently severe skin burns, were clear indicators that they had become victims of acute radiation poisoning. On September 23, 1954, 40-year-old Aikichi Kuboyama finally succumbed to this radiation exposure. After spending nearly seven agonizing months slowly dying from the radiation poisoning, Kubayama would become the first casualty of the hydrogen bomb, and as he lay dying, he pleaded that he would be the last victim of a nuclear weapon. In comparing the Lucky Dragon incident to the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan accused the U.S. of unleashing a third round of nuclear destruction on their nation and treating the fishermen as guinea pigs for collecting data that could lead to further weapons testing. The U.S. completely denied having any hand in what happened to the Lucky Dragon, claiming that they were indeed sailing inside the radioactive danger zones when the bomb was deployed, and even went so far as accusing the fishermen of being communist spies sent to the Marshall Islands to retrieve American military secrets. Naturally, the event strained the relationship between Japan and the U.S. for a period of time, but instead of continuing the disputes, Japan began setting its sights on a much larger and more constructive goal. The Lucky Dragon tragedy sparked an activist movement against the further development of nuclear technology that began in Japan, but would soon spread around the world. Ultimately, though, this grassroots movement just couldn't compete with the ongoing creation and testing of these massively destructive weapons. The U.S. feared that this anti-nuclear movement would turn into an anti-American movement, so in order to ease tensions, the U.S. government donated $2 million in reparations to the surviving fishermen. Before 1954, people feared nuclear weapons solely based around the idea of something being so powerful and so destructive that thousands of lives could be taken and major cities could be crushed in a matter of seconds. But after the fate of the Lucky Dragon became an international headline, light was shed on a new fear, the chronic side effects of radiation exposure. The more public the story got, the more people became aware of the fact that it wasn't the blast itself that devastated the fishing boat. It was the dust, ash, and debris that fell out of the sky afterwards and coated the poor fishermen in a thick layer of toxic radiation. In fact, this residue would become commonly referred to as fallout, which doesn't necessarily have to be thick or even visible to cause severe damage to the human body. And on top of that, it was soon discovered that nearly all of the fish that was being caught contained heavy amounts of radioactive contamination, rendering the fish inedible and threatening the livelihoods of the Japanese people for the many months that followed. This growing awareness of long-term side effects inflicted by nuclear weaponry evolved into a growing paranoia not only felt in Japan, but the world over. As these elevating fears of nuclear war and fallout began permeating popular culture, 
the 1950s saw a growing popularity in science fiction and monster movies that focused on atomic technology and radiation exposure. But it would be a group of filmmakers in Japan, of all places, that turned the close-to-home Lucky Dragon tragedy into one of the most famous and longest-lasting big-screen creations of the atomic age. The genre of giant monster movies greatly predates the days of worldwide nuclear panic. 1925 saw the release of what is considered to be the first significant giant monster movie, The Lost World, a silent film based on the 1912 novel written by Sherlock Holmes creator Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The film's prehistoric creatures were brought to life by special effects wizard Willis O'Brien, who used stop-motion animation techniques that were unlike anything seen before. O'Brien made an even bigger cinematic splash with his work on the original 1933 version of King Kong, which has arguably become one of the most influential films in cinema history, especially with its ambitious stop-motion effects that brought the gigantic ape to terrifying life, and the clever ways he was composited into scenes with live-action actors. Following the widely popular record-setting release of King Kong in 1933, Japanese filmmakers sought to create their own version of the harrowing adventure story by releasing a film called Waisei Kingu Kongu, or in English, Japanese King Kong. Simple enough. In 1938, a second King Kong movie was filmed in Japan. King Kong Appears in Edo. Now as it turns out, both of these Japanese King Kong movies have long since been considered lost films, and only a few photos from the projects remain. It's been rumored that both these movies, along with many other Japanese pictures that predate 1945, were burned up during the firebombings on Japan, or even during the atomic bomb attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. As of right now, no one knows for sure, but historical evidence proves that they did in fact exist at one time, officially making them two of Japan's very first giant monster movies. The original King Kong went on to be re-released in movie theaters several times over the next two decades, each release being a solid box office success. In 1952, the film was unleashed all over the world, and the massive number of tickets sold proved that King Kong was even more popular now than when it was first released in 1933. The following year saw the release of The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, a science fiction-based monster movie that shared similar story details with, and borrowed the title from, a short story by science fiction writer Ray Bradbury, and featured creature effects work by legendary special effects artist Ray Harryhausen, who has always been very open about being directly inspired by Willis O'Brien's effects work on The Lost World and King Kong. In fact, Harryhausen's first major film job was when he was hired on as an animation assistant to O'Brien for 1949's Mighty Joe Young, a film that was initially unsuccessful at the box office, but went on to win the Academy Award for the Best Visual Effects and has since been deemed a classic. Now, what's interesting about The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms was that it was the first monster movie to connect a terrifying creature to the detonation of an atomic weapon, and the idea of producing the film came from both the successful 1952 re-release of King Kong and the growing real-world paranoia surrounding nuclear weapons. This movie's monstrous prehistoric beast is awakened from a frozen slumber following a nuclear bomb testing in the Arctic Circle. The giant reptilian creature soon makes its way to the streets of New York City, destroying anything that stands in its way. Fusing science fiction with real human fears, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms was another big success for the monster movie genre when it was released in the summer of 1953, and it soon paved the way for a brand new trend of atomically charged monster movies that became popular during the 1950s. Since the mid-1940s, Japanese filmmaker Tomoyuki Tanaka had been a prolific movie producer for the Tokyo-based Toho Studios. His many producing credits included a handful of films directed by Akira Kurosawa, who was only one of the most influential filmmakers, um, ever. Just Google him. But in early 1954, producer Tanaka was in a fix. He had been knee-deep in a film project called In the Shadow of Glory, a co-production between Toho Studios and the government of Indonesia that was meant to help ease strained diplomatic relations between the two countries. However, the project eventually fell through, and Tanaka spent the entire plane ride back home from Indonesia in a nervous sweat. The Toho Studios now had an empty slot to fill, and it was up to Tanaka to come up with a new idea, and quick. It was around this time that the Lucky Dragon fishing boat had been ravaged by the hydrogen bomb testing, and legend has it that Tanaka had come up with his new idea for a monster movie on this plane ride while flying over the Marshall Islands and reflecting on the story of the Lucky Dragon. 
Clearly inspired by the resurgence in King Kong's popularity and the successful Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, Tanaka's concept would be a new direction for the Toho Studios, which, prior to this, mainly stuck to producing epic war and action dramas. But following the war, a law was passed that banned the production of war films in Japan, so Toho was looking for any kind of new and innovative ideas to stay in business. Director Ishiro Honda worked at Toho Studios as an in-house director. Throughout the early years of his filmmaking career, he was an assistant director under Akira Kurosawa. But during World War II, Honda was drafted into the Imperial Japanese Army and was taken prisoner in China where he remained a POW until the war ended in 1945. Upon his release, he swiftly returned home to Japan and saw firsthand the devastation the atomic bomb caused in Nagasaki. Honda was psychologically traumatized by what he had seen and became a fervent pacifist and anti-war activist. Eventually, his filmmaking career led him to catch wind of producer Tomoyuki Tanaka's idea of an atomic monster movie, and his interest was piqued. Tanaka approached Eiji Tsuburaya, the head of Toho's visual effects department, to see how expensive it would be and how long it would take to produce a film of this caliber, which was projected to have very ambitious special effects. Tsuburaya first fell in love with monster movies upon his first viewing of King Kong in the 1930s, and he had always dreamed of making a film like it ever since. Zuburaya dissected King Kong inside and out, picking up on how many of the creative special effects were pulled off, which triggered his fascination with this area of filmmaking. By the early 1950s, Zuburaya was a 20-year veteran in the field of special effects. He had a knack for creating highly detailed and convincing miniatures, which he was able to put into good use during World War II when he directed several propaganda films during his early days working for Toho. Needless to say, Tsuburaya's passion for effects-driven monster pictures made him very enthusiastic about Tanaka's proposal right away, and as much as he would have loved to have bring this beast to life in a similar fashion to King Kong with meticulous stop-motion animation techniques, he estimated that it would take an upwards of seven years to complete this film. Obviously, this was out of the question. The budget was limited, and the crew had only mere months to complete this movie. Even though Zuburaya didn't want to admit it, he had to think of another way to make this creature believable, but colleagues of his always knew he was up to any challenge. To help fully realize his vision, producer Tomoyuki Tanaka turned to popular sci-fi and horror novelist Shigeru Kayama to pen a story treatment and lay the groundwork for what type of monster this was going to be. Likely inspired by the beast from 20,000 Fathoms, the monster was originally conceived by Kayama to be some sort of sea creature. More specifically, effects director Eiji Tsuburaya envisioned the monster resembling a giant octopus. Artists from all over Japan were invited to submit design concepts for the creature, which included this early rendering from cartoonist Kazuyoshi Abe that gave the beast more simian-like features and a head that was purposely made to look like a mushroom cloud. Subtle. The film crew wasn't entirely enthusiastic about the designs thus far, so art director Akira Watanabe, along with sculptor Taizo Toshimitsu, worked under the supervision of effects director Tsuburaya to create a new interpretation, something that should be both fresh and recognizable at the same time. Using a children's dinosaur encyclopedia and an issue of American Life magazine for inspiration, sketches were drawn up to make the beast look like a prehistoric predator that had been mutated by an atomic blast. This was achieved by mashing up distinguishable features of several different familiar dinosaurs to create a completely unique look. The creature had an upright posture of a Tyrannosaurus rex, or an Iguanodon, but possessed gnarly dorsal plates on his back, similar to those of a Stegosaurus. Once the sketches were agreed upon, it was now up to sculptor Taizo Toshimitsu to create the three-dimensional clay model for the creature. He created several different variants on the same basic design, with the final approved model giving the beast a very rough skin texture that implied severe scarring it might have received when it was exposed to nuclear radiation. Producer Tomoyuki Tanaka took writer Shigeru Kayama's initial story to director Ishiro Honda and screenwriter Takeo Murata to write the film's final shooting script. Along with drastically changing the monster's personality, Honda injected into the screenplay much of the imagery that would go on to be seen in the finished film, which was inspired by the destruction he had seen firsthand during and after the war. Honda came at this monster movie with the perspective of making it more like a war drama, with the monster embodying the dangers of nuclear combat. Many of these changes would go on to make this monster movie stand out above the others by incorporating complex human emotions, motivations, and ideals. The screenplay was written in close collaboration with effects director Eiji Tsuburaya just to make sure that what was written in the script was physically possible to be pulled off in front of the camera. This late into the game, one major factor still remained undetermined, the name of the creature. Unable to decide on anything that sounded really promising, the crew began referring to the character as simply G, 
which stood for giant. As drafts of the script were still being toyed with, it was given a simple yet mysterious working title, The G Project. And with what all we've touched on so far, you can imagine that the mere task of naming this beast is a story in and of itself. As the filmmakers remained undecided on what to call their new creature, it's been said that the Toho Studios held a contest to help give the monster a name. Now as the legend goes, a heavyset Toho stagehand was given the nickname of Gojira by his co-workers. Gojira was a made-up amalgam of the words Gorira, which is Japanese for gorilla, and Kujira, meaning whale. Poor guy. Now this story is a famous one amongst Godzilla fans, but Kimi Honda, the widow of director Ishiro Honda, claims she never bought into it. The logic was that since the creature dwelled underwater, it could be part whale, but it was already designed to resemble a dinosaur, so logistically, calling it the combination of a gorilla and a whale doesn't make a whole lot of sense. However, considering that during the planning stages, the monster was at one point conceived as being ape-like, and even if you don't take the word gorilla too literally, it could be interpreted that it relates more to the monster's imposing size and physical strength. Now given the challenge of coming up with an interesting way Gojira, or Godzilla, could be brought to life, special effects supervisor A.G. Tsuburaya reluctantly had to abandon his original aspirations of using similar stop-motion animation techniques that he adored from the original King Kong. Tsuburaya realized that the only possible alternative was to have a stuntman inside of a Godzilla costume all the while tapping into his own talent for miniature work to create an entire small-scale replica of downtown Tokyo that could create the illusion that the stunt actor was over 160 feet tall. Now even though this was seen as a last resort in Tsuburaya's eyes, I personally think it's a pretty clever idea, especially considering that this hadn't really been fully executed before in a monster movie in any country, but this resolution surely didn't mean Tsuburaya was taking the easy way out. Unfortunately, when you're a pioneer, there's no one who came before you who can teach you the rules, guidelines, or shortcuts on how to pull off something like this. So creating the Godzilla suit would soon bring about a whole new set of headaches for Tsuburaya and his crew. Sculptor Taizo Toshimitsu had designed the final look for Godzilla in a stunning three-dimensional clay model, and given the creature's upright stance, the design seemed like an ideal fit for a costume that a human being could fit into. But the real challenge was successfully translating Toshimitsu's 3D model into a believable and intimidating monster suit that was still possible for the actor to manipulate from the inside. The prototype for the suit was built by brothers Kanji and Koei Yagi, along with technician Eizo Kaimai, under the supervision of effects director Eiji Tsuburaya. The body cavity of the suit that the actor would slip into was first constructed using bamboo and thin wire, then wrapped in a layer of chicken wire for extra support. Then, this skeletal structure of sorts was covered in a layer of fabric and cushioning. The layer of reptilian skin was created by melting down a huge chunk of latex rubber and spreading it over the suit's surface. More finite details were incorporated into Godzilla's look using additional melted latex before the suit was finally sealed with a coating of charcoal gray colored lacquer varnish. The costume stood about six and a half feet tall with the actor barely being able to see out of Godzilla's neck. Determining that Godzilla would have a powerful, atomically charged breath, an aerosol nozzle was installed inside the head of the costume that would spray a smoky mist. Chosen to wear the costume due to his athleticism, strength, and agility was actor and martial artist Haruo Nakajima. A second actor, Kazumi Tezuka, also slipped on the Godzilla suit during filming, which was likely due to the fact that the suit was so hot and cumbersome that it could only be worn several minutes at a time. However, Nakajima claims that most of the footage of Tezuka in the suit was left out of the final cut. Nakajima first saw the script for Godzilla back when it was still just titled The G Project, but nonetheless, he found himself enthusiastically preparing to play the mysterious creature. Nakajima had asked effects supervisor Eiji Tsuburaya how the monster was going to move, and Tsuburaya responded by telling him just to go watch the original King Kong. Nakajima was fascinated by King Kong, 
He studied the movements, and he also traveled to the zoo to observe how various other beasts carried themselves. But no amount of practice could prepare Nakajima for what he was in for when it was finally time to step inside the Godzilla suit. It was a hot June afternoon when the special effects crew brought in Haruo Nakajima to try on the completed prototype suit for the first time. Nakajima was able to slip into the suit's body cavity via a slit that went up the back, which was cleverly hidden by the rows of Godzilla's dorsal plates. Once he was sealed inside, he was told to start moving around, but nothing happened for several moments. Nakajima then began to show faint signs of movement and attempted to walk. After only taking a few steps, the suit, along with the actor in it, toppled to the ground under its own weight. The crude latex material had completely hardened, and the crew hadn't thought about giving the joints any slack, which made moving around in the thing virtually impossible. Also, the suit builders did not construct the prototype with the measurements of Nakajima in mind, which meant that once he got into the suit, he was essentially swimming in it. Then there was the weight. The prototype may have looked amazing, but all the materials that went into building it added up to over 220 pounds. Understandably, the crew had worked so hard to get the design of the character just right that very little time was put into figuring out the mechanics of how the actor could move around in the suit. The discouraged team now had even less time to build a brand new suit. During this go-round, they used foam, cotton, smaller amounts of bamboo, and instead of the stiff latex rubber, this new suit was coated with liquid plastic. Godzilla was now given bigger arms and an even more upright posture to better accommodate the actor. In the end, however, there still wasn't a huge difference in the suit's mobility, and adding to the weight was the massive urethane tail that dragged behind the outfit. Suspended from overhead, a thin wire was attached to the tail and was used to control its wagging motions. Similarly, Godzilla's minimal facial movements were achieved using wires that were controlled by suit co-constructor Eizo Kaimai. Not wanting to waste the time and effort that went into creating the original prototype suit, it was kept and cut in half. For close-up shots of Godzilla's head and shoulders, the actor wore the top half of the suit. Then if a shot focused on Godzilla's legs, the actor wore the bottom half like a giant pair of baggy pants, complete with a set of suspenders. The new suit may have been a better fit for stuntman Haruo Nakajima, but now this meant that the rough interior lining would constantly scrape across his sweat-covered skin while in motion causing him to break out with numerous rashes and sores. The relentless heat of the studio lights, mixed with the lack of ventilation in the suit, would cause the two suit actors to pass out on several occasions as the interior temperature of the suit climbed to roughly 130 degrees on any given day. The actors suffered from such severe exhaustion after each take that they didn't even have enough strength to get themselves out of the suit without assistance from crew members. Once the actor was successfully detached from the suit, a full cup of his own sweat had to be removed as well. With the cotton inner lining, trapping and being weighed down by so much excreted sweat, it was rendered unwashable, so the lining had to be changed out daily. Stuntman Haruo Nakajima claims that he lost 20 pounds during filming. Both suit actors had problems walking with the gigantic legs, so it wasn't uncommon for them to stumble and fall. Essentially, all Godzilla could do was walk in a straight line, and even that wasn't always easy, given the virtually useless eye holes cut into the neck and the numerous miniature buildings that lay before him. But in the end, the restrictions of the stiff suit actually played quite well into Godzilla's lumbering and inhuman movements, despite the excruciating experience of trying to perform in the costume. On top of that, Godzilla's movements were filmed at four times faster than normal speed, so that when the film would be slowed down to normal speed, it would heighten the illusion of Godzilla's massive size even further. Eiji Tsuburaya's man-in-suit concept, coined Suitmation, was heralded as a groundbreaking advancement for monster movies and would go on to be used time and time again over the course of the next 50 years' worth of Japanese kaiju films. Over 30 minutes into the video, and we're just now getting into the review. Sounds about right. Anyway, like I mentioned at the top of the show, I was never really the biggest Godzilla fan. Will you stop that? Based on what little I'd seen of the franchise over the years and all the goofy parodies Godzilla had spawned, I just sort of wrote these movies off, not even realizing how serious in tone the original movie was and the tragic historical context behind it. And I'll fully admit that before going into this review, I'd never actually sat down and watched the first movie in its entirety before. But it didn't take long for me to realize that for all these years, I had made a grave mistake. 
The movie literally starts off with a bang as two separate fishing boats sailing just off the coast of the fictional Odo Island meet a similar fate following a blinding flash of light that seems to come out of nowhere. Panic grips the Japanese public as scientists and investigators remain completely baffled by what happened to these boats. Okay, so knowing now about the Lucky Dragon fishing boat, I'd call this a pretty clever way to begin your monster movie. By injecting real-world current events into this disaster flick, it fully resonated with moviegoers at the time, turning it into a massive hit. And one can understand how shocking it would be in 1954 to see the first several minutes of the movie unfold like this that so closely mirrored a real-life mishap. It's also interesting to note that at the time of Godzilla's release, critics were universally harsh on this movie, saying how ridiculous and in poor taste it was to exploit the paranoia and fear generated by the Lucky Dragon tragedy in this very American-inspired giant monster movie. Following a torrential rainstorm on Odo Island, which brings us glimpses of Godzilla's destructive power without showing us the creature himself, investigators and scientists are dispatched to the island for further research. Here is where we catch up with our main characters. Dr. Kyohei Yamani, a veteran zoologist, and his daughter Amiko are aboard the island-bound vessel along with naval salvage ship captain Hideto Ogata, with whom Amiko is having an affair, but Amiko is arranged to be married to the mysterious Dr. Daisuke Sirizawa, a mentally tortured scientist disfigured from the war. Already, I was a bit surprised when watching this the first time that a lot of focus is being put on these human characters, since I'd always assumed that humans were the least interesting aspects of the Godzilla franchise but I'll get into that more in a bit. Once the scientists reach Odo Island, they discover the beast's gigantic footprints, and with a Geiger counter, they're able to determine that the prints are emitting heavy levels of nuclear radiation. Within one of the prints, Dr. Yamani discovers a three-lobed marine trilobite, an extinct arthropod that acts as the main piece of evidence proving that the beast they're dealing with is not of this era. Then after a full 20 minutes into the film, history is made as Godzilla is revealed for the first time looming over a grassy hilltop. And even though the special effects used here may not look very sophisticated by today's standards, I think with the tools they had at the time, the filmmakers did a fine job at making a simple hand puppet look like a large hulking monster by compositing it with a shot of people running in fear at the bottom of the screen. It's those iconic yet fleeting special effects money shots that really sell you on the sheer imposing size of Godzilla, and even something as simple as setting a camera at a low angle to look up at the actor in the suit can easily pull off that sort of illusion. Also, I love how director Ishiro Honda made the conscious decision to wait what seems like an eternity in a monster movie to reveal the actual cause of this destruction. Along with that, you hear whispers of the Godzilla legend from the residents of Odo Island and watch as a ceremonial exorcism attempts to ward off the beast, as if Godzilla is believed to be some sort of spiritual demon. This way, suspense is built by not showing us what Godzilla looks like for a while. We're just privy to the damage he's capable of and what the natives believe him to be. Then, by the time we're finally given the big reveal, there's already a bit of an implanted intimidation factor from before that makes the first actual glimpses of him all the more powerful. This scene was originally supposed to be a bit different, however, with Godzilla first appearing with a dead cow hanging out of his mouth, as seen in this photo. But effects supervisor, Ajit Tsuburaya, felt the cow wouldn't even be visible unless it was a certain size. Making the cow appear bigger would, in turn, not look convincing in proportion with the intended size of Godzilla, so the idea had to be cut. Funny enough as it is, a similar idea was put into play several decades later when a certain Tyrannosaurus Rex was first introduced to us as it swallowed a dying goat. With sufficient research gathered from Odo Island, Dr. Yamani returns to Tokyo to present his findings to the Japanese legislature. Here we're basically given all the facts. Godzilla is a rare evolutionary hybrid of both land and sea reptiles from a prehistoric era who had been surviving on his own in a deep sea cave with the possibility of others like him still lurking in the waters below. However, due to the numerous hydrogen bomb tests, his subaquatic dwelling has most likely been destroyed, forcing him to surface. Due to the highly radioactive sand found in his footprints, it's concluded that Godzilla had been mutated by concentrated levels of radiation given off by the H-bombs. Okay. A lot to take in there, but I think this only begins to illustrate the movie's heavy historical importance. Given what we know now how it must have been for the Japanese people to have suffered through not only two horrific atomic bombings of major cities, but also the scares brought on by Fallout, Godzilla is truly symbolic of a nuclear holocaust. But what makes him even more frightening is that at least a nuclear blast can wipe you out in a split second, whereas this lumbering radioactive beast gradually destroys individual cities and livelihoods like it's some kind of slow torture. 
And even if you don't directly suffer his wrath, the radiation he emits represents the wide reach of nuclear fallout created by an atomic blast, which we see grim examples of after he ravages Tokyo later in the film. Even looking beyond all the nuclear war allegories, the country of Japan has had to suffer through a long history of natural disasters like earthquakes, volcanoes, and tsunamis, and one might even perceive Godzilla as being a representation of nature's aggressiveness in that part of the world. Also, what I find interesting about this original Godzilla movie is that it could have easily blamed the Americans for Godzilla's arrival. In fact, some interpret Godzilla to essentially be an embodiment of America, relentlessly attacking Japan in an already weakened state. But I personally don't see it that way. Sure, the Toho Studios has had a history of creating propaganda films during the war, but if you look at what the Japanese people were trying to accomplish during this time, they were far more interested in getting rid of nuclear war altogether than they were trying to start an international fight with a movie about a big radioactive dinosaur, which is especially true if you look at someone like director Oshiro Honda who is now a passionate anti-war activist and pacifist, and the quick sequence that directly follows Dr. Yamani's explanation of Godzilla is a really good example of this. A heated debate quickly erupts in the legislature between those who believe that this information about Godzilla should be kept a secret so it wouldn't inspire any international finger-pointing, and those who are appalled by the idea that this revelation must be kept secret from the public. Both sides of the argument have their good points, and I think it's admirable that the filmmakers take the high road by never mentioning America once in relation to who deployed the H-bombs that awoke Godzilla, even though we all know who did it. I think that would have easily given the movie more of a war propaganda feeling to it, and as a result, it probably wouldn't have ended up being the worldwide classic it became. The movie is more driven to explore how humanity's growing thirst for nuclear war is the real villain here, which may sound a little cliched, but think about it, considering that this is a movie from 1954, it kind of helped create that cliché, which is what makes it an extremely important early example of 1950s Atomic Age science fiction movie making that actually tries to include a touch of subtext. Not long after, it's decided that the information regarding Dr. Yamani's findings on Godzilla is to be made public while a naval squadron of ships are sent out into the waters with depth charges and orders to kill the beast. Of course, the attack proves unsuccessful as Godzilla resurfaces again that night and reveals himself to a frightened group of spectators aboard a party cruise ship. Yamani is brought in to advise military officials on what to do about Godzilla, stating that he would rather see the monster captured and studied than be killed, believing that ongoing scientific research may help in preventing the arrival of more Godzillas. In a lot of these monster movies, all the characters just seem determined to kill whatever threat is out there. But a character like Dr. Yamani is interesting because his opposing viewpoints add a surprising complexity to the human side of things in a movie where the monster is supposed to be the star. Yamani is a zoologist who obviously doesn't want to see any harm brought to this creature, but for more reasons than just wanting to preserve its life. He even raises a good point when questioned on how to kill it. Putting it bluntly, he states that Godzilla was baptized in the fire of the H-bomb and survived. What could possibly kill it now? Dr. Yamani is less interested in seeing the demise of Godzilla than he is in understanding how this dinosaur can survive massive radiation exposure. You could almost say that Yamani's intentions represent the real-world pacifistic approaches to nuclear war, which was an element that was heavily influenced by director Shiro Hondo's post-war experiences, and is illustrated here with Yamani's opposition against an all-out military attack against the beast. Dr. Yamani was played by veteran actor Takashi Shimura, recognized as being a regular player in many films by Akira Kurosawa. In fact, Shimura starred in one of Kurosawa's most famous films, the legendary action-adventure Seven Samurai, which was released the same year as Godzilla. Shimura brings true heart and somberness to the role of Dr. Yamani, where he really makes you believe in his character's convictions in wanting to see Godzilla preserved, and you begin to sympathize with him as he struggles to get his points across to a nation hell-bent on going to war with the ferocious creature. Soon, we finally meet the distressed Dr. Daisuke Sirizawa. His fiance Amiko introduces him to a reporter who has been assigned to write up on Godzilla and wants to inquire the doctor about a rumored experiment he's been conducting that could possibly destroy the monster once and for all. Amiko also plans on finally telling Sirizawa to break off their engagement, but before she can utter the words, Sirizawa allows her to see his secretive experiment. Amiko reacts in horror to what she sees, although interestingly enough, we, the audience, aren't yet granted access to Sirizawa's revelation. Before she can break off the engagement, Amiko leaves in a distressed state, swearing to Sirizawa that she won't tell a soul about what she just witnessed. 
The scene completely leaves you hanging where you're left wondering what Dr. Sirizawa could have possibly done that made Amiko react in such an over-the-top way. Aside from Dr. Yamani, Dr. Sirizawa has to be probably the most intriguing human character in the movie, even though we aren't fully introduced to him until about halfway through. Then up-and-coming Toho actor Akihiko Harada plays Dr. Sirizawa as if the weight of the world rests on his shoulders, and sadly, as it turns out, it kinda does. At first glance, the fact that he's wearing an eye patch can come off as a bit cheesy, but once you learn that it was an injury he sustained during the war, well to me that just adds so many extra interesting layers to his character's mysterious backstory. That one simple piece of information really gives you a fair amount of insight into his grim personality and only adds to Sirizawa's tragic nature. What we're treated to next are two special effects heavy and history making action sequences where Godzilla comes ashore to ravage downtown Tokyo. The Godzilla suit and Eiji Tsuburaya's painstaking miniature work fused together to create two unforgettable action set pieces that pushed the limits of what early 1950s era special effects were capable of. The decision to shoot on black and white film may have been for budgetary reasons, but artistically it adds an expressively dark and ominous tone to the movie, and also helps to enhance the look of the primitive special effects by keeping many of the imperfections concealed in shadow. As an outsider looking in, Godzilla roaming the streets of Tokyo always seemed to be the most defining aspect of these movies to me. You think Godzilla, you think Tokyo and flames and rubble. And even though these well-staged scenes are probably the most intense from this movie, what struck me was that they only take up a small fraction of the story. The movie has already proven that it's much more than your typical monster flick, but these iconic scenes have become so memorable that they still make Godzilla a true monster movie through and through, and an influential one at that. Special effects supervisor A.G. Tsuburaya truly outdid himself by proving that he was able to cleverly execute pretty much any of the visual effects challenges thrown at him, because before the age of computer animation, everything had to be planned out in great detail since it all had to be done practically. Whether it was shining hot studio lights on miniature wax transmission towers to make them melt, or using trick editing and stop motion animation to show a fire truck being sideswiped. Okay, so maybe not every effect holds up, but to me, there will always be a charm and creativity to practical effects such as these. When watching an older movie like this, you know that the filmmakers didn't have computer animation at their disposal, which forced the effects crew to come up with some rather innovative ways of illustrating Godzilla's destruction. Now I believe I've touched on this in previous episodes, about how spoiled we are in this age of computer-generated imagery. Filmmakers can now do any crazy thing they dream up, and as a result, some movies just don't seem to have any restraint anymore. Sometimes it can work, but many times it can become unintentionally cartoonish. I just think back to examples like the first three Indiana Jones movies versus the newer one. The first three hold up so well because even though the special effects were imaginative, there was still a down-to-earth feel to them because they could only really do what 1980s era practical effects allowed them to do. Then Kingdom of the Crystal Skull comes along in 2008, and now all of a sudden we have computer animated prairie dogs, monkeys, and ridiculously over-the-top green screen action sequences that more make my eyes roll than they do thrill me. I think Godzilla works because the movie is clearly of a certain era, but the artistic cleverness behind the execution of the visual effects highly outweighs their somewhat crude and dated look. Now would probably be the best time to highlight the wonderfully ominous score by composer Akira Ifukube, which I think is utilized best during the scenes of Godzilla's Rampage. Ifukube started his musical career as a composer of classical music, a talent which he honed while studying forestry in college. Following World War II, Ifukube began scoring music for films and would go on to score over 250 movies during his career but the score of Fukube is probably best known for out of all of them is Godzilla. Not to mention the large amount of Toho produced monster movies he went on to score afterwards. Not only is Fukube famous for scoring Godzilla, he's also credited for creating Godzilla's iconic roar and thunderous stomping. Nowadays, a beastly roar is commonly composed of a sophisticated mixing of different real world animal noises. But Ifukube's unique discoveries made Godzilla's legendary sound effects essentially just extensions of the musical score itself. In creating Godzilla's now famous roar, Ifukube rubbed a leather glove along the loosened strings of a double bass, then slowed down the recording. 
He also came up with Godzilla's booming footsteps when he accidentally knocked over an amplifier box, later deciding to record the sounds of himself kicking the box. Since then, Godzilla's distinguishable sounds have become as recognizable as Godzilla himself, just as Akira Fukube's film score, which encompasses an underlying feeling of impending doom, has set a standard for countless science fiction and monster movies that follow. The aftermath of Godzilla's attacks leaves Tokyo in complete ruin. Crowded hospitals are overflowing with victims either injured by the demolition or poisoned by Godzilla's radiation. Amiko finally breaks down and tells Dr. Sirizawa's shocking and spoiler-filled secret to Ogata. It seems that during Sirizawa's research, he stumbled across the discovery of an oxygen destroyer, a frightening and potentially world-altering weapon that has the power to annihilate oxygen atoms and reduce living organisms to mere bones. Yeah, it doesn't make much sense. but. It doesn't matter, because I think instead of getting caught up in scientific logic, it's more interesting to look at it as yet another thematic symbol for nuclear war and atomic weapons. Dr. Sirizawa is no doubt disturbed by what he has uncovered, something so powerful that it could easily cause another Hiroshima or Nagasaki, or maybe something worse. And because of this, he strongly refuses to use the Oxygen Destroyer, even if it means heroically killing Godzilla. Sirizawa looks beyond the termination of Godzilla to something far worse for humanity, like his technology getting into the wrong hands. It's no wonder that many have compared Dr. Sirizawa to the infamous nuclear physicist J. Robert Oppenheimer, who took heavy part in the development of the first atomic bomb, and who lived out the rest of his life haunted by what his scientific discoveries were turned into. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, However, after Dr. Sirizawa watches a somber news broadcast that includes many shots of suffering victims and a performance from a mournful girls' choir, he reluctantly decides to use the Oxygen Destroyer just this one time to finally kill Godzilla once and for all. It's a pretty powerful and somewhat sobering little sequence that's surprising to see in a genre movie like this, and it almost makes you forget what kind of movie you're watching. It's not every day that you see a giant monster flick that includes all of these exciting scenes of death and destruction, but then jolts you out of those conventional genre sensibilities, only to bring you back into a more realistic world where we actually see the frightening and agonizing results of the monster's attacks. A Navy vessel takes Ogata and Dr. Sirizawa out to the middle of Tokyo Bay so the two can dive to the bottom and plant the oxygen destroyer. After spotting Godzilla, Dr. Sirizawa begins to activate the device as Ogata returns to the surface. Sirizawa then purposely severs his line, telling Amiko and Ogata to go live a happy life. Rather than seeing his devastating invention perverted by others, he decides to sacrifice himself, letting all the information and data about the Oxygen Destroyer die with him. In an instant, the bomb goes off, and Godzilla is soon reduced to a skeleton. Despite Sirizawa's heroic deed, Dr. Yamani is still fearful of what the future might bring. If we continue to test nuclear weapons, then the world hasn't seen the last of Godzilla's kind. I believe this was the perfect way to end this story, which is pretty bittersweet. For the sake of mankind, Sirizawa allows himself to die with Godzilla, but the real-world threat of nuclear weapons still exists. Now, unlike most horror franchises where the monster or villain always comes back after it's assumed they're dead, the grim ending of Godzilla is certainly more substantial than your typical ham-fisted cliffhanger. It sums up what this whole movie is about and what real-world threats it believes we should do away with, even though to this day, certain fears continue to linger. And rightfully so. Japanese audiences came out in droves to watch Godzilla when it was unleashed on November 3rd, 1954. It became a huge box office success despite harsh critical response. 
At the time of its release, I suppose I can understand the criticism that the film was exploiting nuclear paranoia, but I think what used to be seen as a distasteful appropriation of tragic current events has since become an important post-World War II time capsule, disguised as a highly entertaining and surprisingly serious science fiction monster movie. When Godzilla was released in Japan in late 1954, it was a massive commercial success. For many at this time, seeing Godzilla had a post-war cathartic effect, and watching him trample on a localized city like Tokyo really struck a chord with the Japanese people, especially seeing him destroy familiar landmarks, like the Parliament Building, for instance. The Japanese people had gone through so many hardships over the years that, in a way, they saw Godzilla as a means of wiping the slate clean so they could start anew. And even though Godzilla was this enormous, destructive beast on the loose, the movie brilliantly builds up a certain sense of sympathy for him akin to the way King Kong plays out. You watch as these animals arrive in sprawling metropolises, smashing anything and anybody that gets in their way, not because Godzilla and King Kong are pure evil or anything, they're just animals. They're misunderstood creatures, one being brought, in captivity mind you, to New York City to be displayed as a circus sideshow of sorts, while the other had his dwelling rudely taken away from him by mankind's nuclear weapons testing. So what do animals typically do when they feel threatened? Well, they act on instinct, even if that means destroying an entire urban area. While King Kong manages to incorporate a bit of a love story in there, I think Godzilla is purely and simply trying to defend himself. I assume his first attacks occurred not long after the H-bomb tests destroyed his home, so even from the start, he's reacting to what's being done to him by first attacking the fishing boats and the residents of Odo Island. Then the military deploys depth charges into the water in an attempt to kill him. Naturally, that pisses Godzilla off, but you could also probably say he's scared, so he makes his way to Tokyo to try and eliminate the threat. Godzilla goes back into the water, but it isn't long before he returns for round two to finish the job he started. After doing much more significant damage this time, Dr. Sirizawa catches Godzilla off guard, and he kills him. But it's certainly not a quick death. Godzilla swims to the surface, writhes in pain, sinks back to the depths, and finally disintegrates in a somewhat melancholy fashion. Even though Godzilla is dead, the movie doesn't have a feel-good triumphant ending mainly because the focus shifts to Dr. Yamani's fears of ongoing nuclear testing. I just think it's fascinating that both Godzilla and King Kong succeed at playing up the monsters as terrifying creatures throughout, only to make you feel a bit sorry for them when they finally meet their demise at the hands of man. It may sound like a cliché nowadays, but hey, all clichés have to start somewhere. Nearly a year after Godzilla made a huge splash in Japan, a set of small-time Hollywood producers in the United States came across this Japanese monster movie that was being shopped around by the Toho Studios as an export, and saw that it may have potential to play successfully for American audiences. Well, sort of. Editor and director Terry Morse was brought in to take the original Godzilla and do a little work on it to make it a bit more palatable for American audiences. Morse not only did heavy editing on the original movie, but also filmed brand new scenes that featured Western actors, predominantly TV and film actor Raymond Burr, who would later go on to become the famous TV defense attorney, Perry Mason. These new scenes were intercut into already existing sequences from the Japanese version to create the illusion that Burr's character was present for nearly everything that happened in the original movie. Now, having him added in as, essentially, the star of the movie, the Japanese stars are now kind of pushed off into the periphery as supporting characters. Raymond Burr plays a news reporter by the name of Steve Martin. <laughs> you see, because they have the same... <laughs> okay, it wasn't that funny. Explained in a voiceover, Martin has a stopover in Tokyo while on a business trip to Cairo and has caught wind of a mysterious menace that has been causing havoc out in the sea. We follow Martin's character as we weave in and out of various scenes from the original movie, occasionally cutting back to Martin to make it look as if he's standing in the same room as the pre-recorded Japanese actors, and instead of the film doing heavy English voice dubbing over the Japanese dialogue, Martin is usually seen with a translator, explaining to him what is happening in the scene. <laughs> I'm afraid my Japanese is a little rusty. 
Now what's actually kind of unintentionally funny about this concept is that the translator is really just saying what the American filmmakers want him to, which completely disregards what the Japanese actors are actually saying. <laughs> but that's okay, because to us stupid English-speaking Americans, the Japanese language is just a bunch of mumbo-jumbo. Am I right? Huh? This new Americanized version was retitled Godzilla King of the Monsters and was released on April 27, 1956 in the US, becoming a pretty big hit despite critics once again panning it. Dynamic violence, savage action, spectacular thrill, Godzilla King of the Monsters. This soon led to Godzilla getting exposed to other parts of the world such as South America and Europe and as the years passed, you probably couldn't find a place in the world untouched by Godzilla's giant footprint. Now despite its importance in making Godzilla popular outside of Japan, how does it hold up in comparison to Ashiro Honda's original vision? All in all, Raymond Burr is fine with what he's given to do. He's got a great presence as a leading man, and fully embraces the, what must have been at the time, strange concept of being placed into the lead role of an already established foreign film. But if you were to watch this version right after watching the masterfully done original Japanese version, this one comes off as a bit goofy here and there. I still really like it, and I appreciate its purpose and inventiveness, but just knowing that Raymond Burr is plucked in there and being forced into the same space as the original actors has a way of taking you out of the movie, which I think lessens the drama of the Japanese version. It's clever with how it does it, but it pales in comparison to the original and should only be considered as an interesting companion piece to the original. Despite all that, I'm surely not saying it isn't worth a watch. I just think some of the important thematic elements are kind of missing in this cut, and the new scenes add a bit of cheesiness to a brilliantly serious monster movie, turning it into more of your typical 1950s sci-fi fare. Still, it must have done something right because Godzilla King of the Monsters made a big enough impact to eventually transform Godzilla from an offbeat Japanese nuclear allegory into a world-renowned pop culture phenomenon. So, it's all led up to this. Now let's crack open the special Godzilla Blu-ray package from the good folks at the Criterion Collection and see what lurks inside. And just from looking at the front cover, you're already sucked in by the dynamic artwork created by comic book writer and illustrator Bill Sinkovich. For the eye-grabbing package design, the black and white look of the movie is put aside to incorporate watery blues and fiery oranges that not only perfectly complement each other, but also effectively illustrate the two prominent natural elements that are played with in the movie. Open up the first flap and you'll see a small booklet that includes a bunch of information about the disc, including the chapter listing, cast and crew credits, a detailed breakdown of the audio and video cleanup and digital transferring processes, and a write-up of Godzilla's historical importance by Village Voice senior film critic Jay Hoberman. We open up the second flap and get this really cool little pop-up image of the big guy. And... Hey, hey, wait a minute. This doesn't look like the original Godzilla. Actually, this image is a takeoff of the Godzilla design from the 2002 film Godzilla Against Mechagodzilla. And they thought we wouldn't notice. Anyway, let's continue on with the disc itself. The menu has a very clean and organized look to it, and as you navigate, these little dialogue boxes will shift into place and explain the special feature you're about to view, which makes finding what you need clear and simple. As you head into the supplemental material, we see first on the list the Americanized version of the film, Godzilla, King of the Monsters. It's great that they included this version as a bonus feature on the disc, which basically means you're getting two feature-length films for the price of one. When you're finished checking out the American cut, you can head down to the cast and crew section where you'll see a handful of brand new extended interviews featuring the likes of lead actor Akira Takarada, who played Hideto Ogata in the film, Haruo Nakajima, who was the main actor wearing the Godzilla suit, special effects technicians Yoshio Iri and Eizo Kaimai, and finally, a much lengthier interview with score composer Akira Ofukube. Next, in the photographic effects featurette, special effects director Koichi Kawakita and effects cameraman Motoyoshi Tomioka introduce to you various shots in the film that were created using trick shot compositing. I'm positive that once you watch this feature, you'll see some shot compositions that were so subtle you probably never even realized they were enhanced with visual effects, which is most likely a testament to how much the black and white film hides some of this stuff. 
Next up, we have a new interview with Japanese film critic Tadao Sato, who reflects on the original film and its place in Japanese culture. Then we have a feature entitled The Unluckiest Dragon, an illustrated audio essay detailing the tragic Lucky Dragon No. 5 incident near Bikini Atoll, narrated by Columbia University Associate Professor of Japanese History Greg Flugfelder. Finally, in the bonus features section, we have the original theatrical trailers for both Godzilla and Godzilla King of the Monsters. Last but certainly not least, we're granted to two separate audio commentaries from author and film historian David Callett, the writer of the critical history and filmography of Toho's Godzilla series, and a self-proclaimed Godzilla obsessive. Callett's commentaries on both versions of the film are extremely engaging and informative listens, and his passion for Godzilla is very apparent while you take in his non-stop fact-spewing and gushing. His undying love for the Godzilla franchise rubs off a bit on a Fairweather fan like myself, since he's able to articulate so well why he's so affectionate towards the character, and why he thinks Godzilla is an important piece of cinema history. And I'll bet even the most hardcore Godzilla fans will learn a thing or two from listening to these thorough commentaries. Now when watching this on your widescreen TV, remember that the film's original aspect ratio, like many from this time period, is 1.37 to 1, so it will come off as a full screen presentation as opposed to the widescreen look we take for granted nowadays. The digital transfer is about as good as one can hope for, considering the delicate Japanese film being used at this time was a lot more susceptible to dust, hair, and scratching during processing. And the little booklet that came with the disc claims that thousands of instances of dirt, debris, scratches, splices, etc. were all digitally touched up during the transferring process. Still, for a film shot in 1954, the picture is pretty damn good. That being said, the American film scenes in Godzilla King of the Monsters has notably better picture quality than almost any of the Japanese footage, but that's due to the quality of the original sources being only so good. Along with that, the film's original mono audio track was also manually remastered, where various clicks, thumps, and hisses were digitally touched up. Godzilla, or Gojira as it were, is an excellent film. Now I know there are plenty of Godzilla fans out there right now screaming, duh, at me, but I'll venture a guess and say that there are fans of some of the later Godzilla movies who've probably never even seen this first one. If that's the case, or if you're like me and have never even seen any of the Godzilla films in full, or worse yet, you've only seen the 1998 American version, yikes, then by all means, you must give this a chance, and I think you'll see why this went on to spawn a loyal global fan base. Godzilla fans should be proud of the Criterion Collection for releasing such a well-done Blu-ray that they can be satisfied with, despite one minor design flaw and a package that made yours truly into a fairly new fan of the big scaly one. And with that, I'll give Godzilla and this Criterion Collection Blu-ray a 5 out of 5 discs recommendation. This is a must-own movie. This original Godzilla takes what should be a ludicrous concept very seriously. And in doing so, we get a film that's not only entertaining, but also thematically important. The historical context behind what made Godzilla so terrifying back in the day still kind of holds up now, because let's face it, nuclear weapons are still out there. But Godzilla can stand for so much more than just that. He can be the embodiment of any collective human fear, whether it be nuclear weapons, terrorism, war, disease, the list can go on and on. Godzilla is relentless, and as long as there's something to be afraid of in this world, Godzilla can be a prominent cinematic symbol of dread, paranoia, and destruction, which is why the King of the Monsters has continued to live on now for nearly six decades in the minds and hearts of moviegoers everywhere. After Godzilla became such a big hit when it was released in Japan in 1954, a sequel was quickly rushed into production. In 1955, a whole year before Godzilla was ever introduced to American audiences, Toho released Godzilla Raids Again, which didn't actually resurrect the original Godzilla, but saw the awakening of a second one. The final Godzilla film to be shot in black and white, this new Godzilla battled another giant monster for the very first time an Ankylosaurus-type creature named Anguilus, and Takashi Shimura reprised his character of Dr. Yamani. Surprisingly, 
Godzilla Raids Again was not a big hit when it was released in 1955, and it fared even worse in the United States when it was released in 1959 under the strange new title, Gigantus the Fire Monster, passing this new Godzilla off as a completely different type of creature. Okay, so let me get this straight. The original one was a hit, so you go and change the name of the sequel and the monster. Boy, how marketing has changed. After Godzilla Raids Again basically came and went, the Toho Studios put Godzilla into indefinite hibernation, but continued to create monster and sci-fi movies throughout the rest of the 1950s and the early 60s, including Rodan, The Mysterians, Battle in Outer Space, and Mothra. In 1962, Godzilla returned to face off against the monster that originally inspired his creation, the one and only King Kong. Well, kinda. Toho took great liberties with their King Kong, giving him superpowers and making him as tall as Godzilla. This proved to be a hit, so Toho continued to churn out more Godzilla movies during the 60s and into the 70s, with each movie progressively getting more and more outlandish. The producers were starting to take notice of Godzilla's appeal to younger kids, so they started depicting him as more of a superhero, continuing to battle against other giant monsters. Finally, in 1975, producer Tomoyuki Tanaka decided to pull the plug on the franchise with the release of Terror of Mecha Godzilla. The end of the film has Godzilla going out into the sea where he would remain for the next decade. In 1984, producer Tomoyuki Tanaka sought to take Godzilla back to his original, darker roots. Also, it was now the 30th anniversary of the original film's release, so the franchise began a new era with this reboot entitled, oddly enough, Godzilla. Just Godzilla. Or what it has since become commonly referred to as the return of Godzilla, to avoid confusion. Even though this was the 16th film in the franchise, it completely disregarded any of the sequels to the original and brings Godzilla back to being a destructive, terrifying monster. A year later, the film was exported to the US, and just like the original Godzilla, this one was renamed and re-edited. Given the new title, Godzilla 1985, this American version brought back Raymond Burr as news reporter Steve Martin, although now that Steve Martin was also the name of a famous comedian and actor, he's only referred to in this movie as Mr. Martin. Godzilla 1985 successfully rebooted the franchise and spawned six more movies up through 1995 with the release of Godzilla vs. Destroya, which was planned to be the final Godzilla film. In this one, several references to the original movie are explored, such as the oxygen destroyer that killed the first Godzilla being responsible for the creation of all these other monsters, and even actress Momoko Kochi briefly reprised her role of Amiko. During the emotional climax, Godzilla's highly radioactive heart begins to melt him down. So the meltdown doesn't cause a catastrophic explosion, he's cooled off by the military's freezing weapons and slowly disintegrates. The radioactive energy that's emitted during Godzilla's slow death is transferred to his son, but with this film supposedly being the last in the series, that plotline is never explored further. By now, the original Godzilla was celebrating its 40th anniversary, and Godzilla vs. Destroya was now the 22nd movie in the franchise. In 1997, producer Tomoyuki Tanaka, the man who started it all, died at the age of 86. Not only was he the one who first conceived the idea for Godzilla, he had been the producer of every single one of the Toho Studios monster movies up until the release of Godzilla vs. Destroya, which was meant to be the definite end of the Godzilla franchise to make way for the American reboot that was released in the summer of 1998. Independence Day director Roland Emmerich and star Matthew Broderick turned in this new Godzilla reboot of sorts, which felt more like a cheap Jurassic Park ripoff than anything else. Well, that or a shoddy remake of The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Pick your poison. True Godzilla fans were furious about how much this new version missed the mark on pretty much every level. And all these years later, I see what they mean. In response to the much-reviled 1998 American Godzilla, Toho Studios brought back their true Godzilla as fast as they could with Godzilla 2000, which was released in 1999, only one year after the disappointment of the American reboot, remake, whatever the hell it was. Godzilla 2000 successfully rebooted the original Japanese franchise a second time and spawned five more movies. Godzilla Final Wars was released in 2004 and was the 28th film in the franchise. 
Now the original Godzilla was celebrating its 50th anniversary, so it was decided that this would now truly be the balls to the wall finale that would once again see the end of this long running franchise, even though Godzilla doesn't die at the end of this one. Godzilla Final Wars brought in a plethora of giant monsters seen in many of the previous Godzilla movies to do battle in this epic conclusion. One highlight from Final Wars that must be brought up is that the lame computer-animated American Godzilla, officially shortened by Toho Studios to just Zilla, makes a brief cameo appearance and swiftly gets his ass handed to him by the one true Godzilla. Now that is awesome. To this day, Godzilla Final Wars remains to be the last film in the famed Toho Godzilla franchise, but it's been going around for a while now that Warner Brothers Studios and Legendary Pictures are collaborating on a brand new reboot of Godzilla slated to be released in 2014, the 60th anniversary of the original film's release. Gareth Edwards, the writer and director of the 2010 independent movie Monsters, is directing this new reboot, and judging by this early teaser poster that includes the original Japanese characters for Gojira, this new take looks to, once again, bring Godzilla back to his dark, ominous, and Japanese roots. And by Japanese roots, I mean the movie will star the kid from Kick-Ass, that Olsen sister who isn't one of the twins, Walter White, and that French chick. And wait a minute. Oh, and uh, Ken Watanabe. So there, Japanese roots. Okay, so besides this upcoming movie suffering from a typical case of Hollywood whitewashing, one big question still remains. Can we actually do Godzilla right this time? Or will it end up being another stinker like the 1998 American reboot? I suppose only time will tell. Well, that'll about bring us to the end of this lengthy dissection of one of cinema history's greatest monsters. Thanks for joining me today on this exploration behind the original Godzilla, and make sure to catch more episodes of the DVD Shelf Movie Reviews at HappyDragonPictures.com. So I'll see you next time, but for now, this one's going back on the DVD Shelf. Well, sounds like Godzilla's still roaming around outside. What am I gonna do? I just spent Lord knows how long talking about the guy only to come to the conclusion that oxygen destroyers don't exist. So, I guess we're shit out of luck, folks. Unless... What? Hey, buddy. What do you want? Oh, nothing much. Well, maybe one tiny little favor. Oh, come on. Didn't I do the logo at the beginning like always? You're not paying me enough to do much else. All right, let me just cut to the chase. Where are you right now? Oh, my dank little apartment that your small paychecks are graciously paying for. Why? Your apartment? Haven't you been watching the news? Um, a Webster marathon is on and you're asking me if I'm watching the news? Come on! Uh, okay, fair enough. But, but your apartment is downtown. It's right there. What's your point? Well, whether or not you've been watching the news, you, you haven't perhaps run into, oh, I don't know, any 165-foot dinosaurs roaming around your street corner? I... No. W what are you talking about? You're such a putz. Look, go over to your window. I guarantee you'll get what I'm talking about. All right, but I don't know what you expect me to... <laughs> See? And what in the hell did you call me for? Well, I need you to take him down. Are you f***ing kidding? Oh, come on, Happy Dragon. You... Oh, okay, first off, I have a name. It's Steve, okay? What the hell is so hard to remember about Steve? All right, listen, Steve. Yeah, what, Marion? Funny. Anyway, you're a dragon, right? Last time I checked. And don't dragons have some magical power of growing really tall? Well, what the hell kind of stereotype is that? It doesn't even make any sense. Listen, you grow big or what? Why? Well, because what I'm going to need you to do is pack on another... Uh, say, 160 feet and take down that treacherous beast. You're... you're kidding, right? Steve? You're our only hope. Good day, sir. Wait, wait! 
Don't hang up. Listen. Kill Godzilla, and I'll give you a raise. 75%. 30. 60. 40. 50. All right, fine. Fine. 50. And in advance, don't push it. <sighs> I can't believe I'm doing this. Hey! Hey! Ugly! Why don't you pick on someone your own size? Hello, I'm Jay Sherman. On this special Oscar Week episode of Coming Attractions, I'll look at films Oscar passed over, like Children of a Lesser Godzilla. Godzilla is not so bad. He just cannot hear you. <laughs> Oh! Or was that eat you? Oh well. <laughs>